Hi, everybody. Well, this is a very intimidating group to talk to because um, I, each of you are fabulous experts in your own capacity and who are adept in changing the conversation as well as the direction of things. And I have great admiration for what you all do and what your organizations do, have, are doing and have done. And, um, and I'm also extremely, if the whole can sometimes be greater than the sum of the parts, I, I think that Help Age and Pfizer today have put together a group that has the potential to be that. And, uh, and very moving, thank you. Um, so I, I'm supposed to move over. This is more formal than I was prepared for. Can you hear? No, okay. <laughs> um, so I was trying to think as I was listening to the wonderful panel discussion before in the Q&A how I could contribute to the discussion of such an eminent and knowledgeable group. And so I, I'd like to contribute a few fun things and then hopefully some framing uh, of what we're talking about, at least from one person's point of view. Um, I, since I, I, I told you briefly when we were making introductions that there was a moment in 1985 when I wasn't a geriatrician and then 26 hours later I was. <laughs> and um, the thing that, that uh, brought me up short and made me go back and get yet more training <laughs> to be a geriatrician was uh, really, what was data that still takes my breath away. Um, so some of you have heard me say this before, but it is astounding the remarkable achievement that humanity has accomplished in the last hundred years that we have added 30 years plus to human life expectancy. That is extraordinary. Never before experienced in human history. An extraordinary accomplishment. It's the accomplishment of all of you in the room. It's the accomplishment of people all over the world. It's the investment in, in aspirational ways, in public health, in poverty alleviation, in education, and in medical care. And um, it's an astounding feat. And it is not limited to any one part of the world. In fact, there is no part of the world where life expectancy is not increasing. Um, and as this group knows, as well as anybody, um, not only has life expectancy increased in the developed world over 100 years, we have gone from life expectancy in 1900 of 47 years at birth, 47 years. Could expect to live to 47 on average. Uh, to 80 ish, 80 plus, it's increasing. But in the developing world, we're seeing the same things. Um, the only difference, which this group knows really well, is that in the developing world, what happened in 100 years in the developed world is taking 40 or less year, fewer years in the developing world. So here's another. Thing that I realized a, a little while ago, which also takes my breath away. A young person growing up right now in a developing country, in a youth bulge country, where more than 30% of the population is under 25, that same young person growing up in a young country, a young society, is going to grow old in an old society. Isn't that breathtaking? So developing countries are aging at the same rate as the individuals within them. That's also never before happened in history. And um, in many parts of life, timing matters. Uh, in this case, timing may matter exquisitely. So, um, one of the things that I've noticed, uh, so, so places like the Hartford Foundation under Corey Reader's leadership for 30 years have been invested in creating the knowledge so that we have the medical care systems in particular and the professionals to take care of an aging population. Created exemplary models. 
We've learned a lot over the last 30 years. We know that prevention matters as people get older. We didn't know that 30 years ago. Now it sounds easy. Um, we've, we've learned a tremendous amount from investments in the developed world. And then the question was casually pitched to us earlier today, well, how can that help us think about the developing world? So um, I'd like to reflect on a couple of frames, and I think they are matched by the wonderful Help Age UNFPA uh, UN document that you, I'm sure you all read. So um, first of all, I think we have a collective disease, which is deeply human. Um, there are a number of physicians in the room. Um, there's a disease that is, a, a, it's not a disease, it's a manifestation called a scotoma. Um, a scotoma is, the, is a hole in your vision as a result of a stroke to the optic nerve. And because of that stroke, there is a hole where you can't see anything, but you don't know you can't see anything. That's the key. You think you see everything. But in fact, there's a hole there, and you don't know what you're missing. Um, as a, it is so deeply human to avert our gaze in the face of thoughts of death. And because we think about aging allied with death, that in the face of this immense success of human history, the young people whose lives we save now get to grow old, we have a scotoma about looking at how to prepare for a society in which they get old. The U.S. has it. Well, you know, Corey knows that in spades. <laughs> but I don't think anybody's exempted because it's, so, it's such a deeply human thing. Um, and so we have some frames that I think come from our psychology about how much we don't want to grow old personally and die that then pervade our <coughs> policy. Um, and if there's one lesson that the developing world could learn from the developed world, it is to resolve the scutum. <laughs> now, the Madrid Declaration was all about that. It did an amazing job of saying that developing countries that ignore the issues of an aging society put their development agenda at risk. That's pretty straightforward. Um, but we still have a huge number of myths which are part of our scotoma and keep us from making progress. We have myths of our inheritance of another way we think, which is an either or thing. I think it must be deeply embedded in our mentality as human beings that we think in either or. So either we put our resources into kids, or we put our resources into old people. And if I give you resources for old people, I must hate children. Um, it's a guarantee. <laughs> um, so in fact, if you look at these myths, which are born of many things which are maybe not so admirable, uh, none of them hold up. It's not true that if you give jobs to old people that you're taking them away from kids. It's not true that if you have an aging society, a country will go broke. Um, it, one, it's not true that if you take care of old people well, that everyone else will get harmed. Uh, Donna was talking about that before, thank you. Um, but our, our default option are these deeply ingrained fears which turn into myths which devolve into policies. So then I often think, well, who are we talking about? Who are those old people? And, and um, you know, if I'm teaching a group of undergraduates, which I sometimes do, I say, well, close your eyes and picture an old person. And there are two options. Uh, when they raise their hands and tell me who they're picturing. One is they picture a loved grandparent, and the other is they picture somebody who they would call decrepit, a very fearful image. Um, so we, we go back and forth in terms of our mental visioning. But, but we're talking about, um, as many of you have said already so eloquently, we're talking about people we love. 
we're, we might also be talking about ourselves, but we're, we're talking about people we love. We're talking about what's going to happen to our parents, and we're also talking about what the future is for our grandkids. Um, so what is the society that we want our grandchildren to not just grow up in, but grow old in? Um, that is the question, in my experience, that transcends politics and brings people together. So um, there has been wonderful talk today about what the foundations might be of what we want or what, and what we need for our grandkids. One, of course, is a rights-based approach that we recognize that actually People of all ages deserve the protection of equal human rights and assurance of protection for those who are vulnerable. Um, and that includes um, legal protections. It also includes the social protection of retirement and pensions and a floor of ability to um, economically, in the money category that you were saying before, uh, to be able to survive with some dignity. Um, so, so our values about what we want to be as a society, what we want our grandkids to live in, matter hugely. Um, and of course, we also know that uh, in in this reality that we're all in this one together, if one group is cast off, we're all cast off, right? Um, and in fact, we are all in this together in many other ways. It is true, as someone said before, that um, the myth that older people take but don't give, which was uh, perhaps a, a unique, uh, an American construct of the 1980s, um, is a myth. Uh, you know, the evidence, if you look at it, is that intergenerational transfers flow mostly from, young to, from old to young and a little bit from young to old. That um, people not in the workforce because they can't get a job want to work and the limitation is if they're too sick or disabled but not in their minds about what they want to do. And they want to um, this all take and all, uh, all take no give kind of deficit equation which we've constructed about what it means to be an aging society is not borne out in, even in the hard data. So if you look at, in the US, at the amount of in-kind resources that older adults contribute to the US economy in terms of volunteering, they can, for others, um, they contribute $162 billion worth of volunteering time in a year, older people. That's more money than U.S. long-term care costs. So um, that's even ignoring grandparents raising grandchildren, whether it's in the U.S. or any other where, where else in the world, uh, informal caregiving of family, of friends, of neighbors. So, uh, and it doesn't even begin to take into account the historic to, and to the present roles of older adults in society in terms of um, the, the establishers of values, the transmitters of culture, the community watch and glue, the people uh, who sit on the front stoop and hold those kids to account if they're misbehaving. Um, that even ignores all that other stuff which we silently take for granted. So, so who are we talking about? Well, it's us. So if we get past the it's them, we don't need them, they don't do anything, and we remember it's us, um, then what do we do? Well, um, you know, the Mar Madrid plan laid out three priority directions. Uh, all of which are, are critically um, important and well said. One is the issues of older persons in development, including, and I'll quote, active participation, work, rural development and migration, urbanization, emergencies, social protection. Um, this is a grouping of what I would call both the needs and the opportunities. And then there's some basics, some needs, health, 
health and well-being into old age, um, healthy and longer living, health promotion, uh, universal and equal access to health care, uh, ensuring, enabling, and supportive environments. Um, I accept those, and I'm sure everybody here would as well. And then we say, well, how on earth do we do this? How do we proceed? And um, I, I think you have to create a couple of mind frames to know how to, uh, to push this forward. And, and I think this group totally gets that. But, but, but one is that because there are specific and important needs that have to be addressed when people are in old age, um, we have to also see the opportunities uh, because I think it's deeply human to um, not build the needs for the needs well if we don't see the upsides. Um, and the upsides actually, some of them have to be, could be created. So how do we go from what the scotoma we have <laughs> And this assumption of a negative deficit situation um, arising out of this unprecedented success of human history. Um, how, how do we proceed? How do we build? We actually have the opportunity, never before in human history, to build a new life stage. 30 extra years of human life, what do we do with them? Um, now, one way to think about what we do with them is to think about that old adage about lampposts. You, I'm sure you all know that. You know? So if you lose your keys outside and you, you spend all your time looking around under the lamppost and you can't find it, uh, and then somebody comes by and you say, I, I just can't find my keys. I know they're here somewhere. And they say, well, where'd you drop them? And you say, oh, I dropped them over there. And they say, well, why are you looking under the lamppost? It's because it's the only place I can see. Um, <laughs> So uh, thinking about how you create a whole new stage of human history, um, of, hu of human life course, um, sometimes we go about it as though all we can do is find what we knew under that same lamppost. But this is, in fact, a startup opportunity. It's the entrepreneurial opportunity of, a of, uh, of history, is that <laughs> we can say, well, what would we want this to be? Um, now, there are things we need it to be. We need a foundation of values and rights. They need to be, as was said before, gender sensitive. They need to be protect the vulnerable and assure our vision of who we are as human beings across the life course. We need social protection. And we need to understand, for example, that social protection policies are not old age giveaway policies, they are family policies. Um, the biggest thing the U.S. has forgotten when it fights over Social Security is that Social Security in 1932 was created to be a family policy. It was created to ensure that working age people didn't lose their standard of living when they did the right thing and took care of their pa parents. That's why Social Security was created. Ditto Medicare, by the way. And if you look at around the world, you see lots of evidence that so that Social protection policies are family policies. So these are not um, uniquely for one age group. Uh, the most dramatic example is the study that was done in South Africa when, when pensions were put in place in the townships and the South African government, uh, in collaboration with Esther Duflo and her colleagues, had the foresight to do this in a randomized trial in which they actually initiated the pensions in some townships and randomly um, allocated no pensions for a little while to others and then looked at the difference. And the difference was that in the townships where the older black grandmothers, for the first time in their lives, had a pension, their granddaughters were taller, weighed more, and were better educated compared to the townships where, the, where um, they weren't getting pensions. Social protection is a family policy. We have other needs. We need to put in place approaches that keep people healthy through longer lives. Uh, the Lancet recently published the uh, uh, 
the startling information that our life expectancy is increasing, um, but our health expectancy is not keeping up. So how to address that? Well, there are two major ways. One is um, to put in place a, a similarly a life course approach to prevention, as many of you have said here today, understanding that, it, that in addition to saving people's lives at the moment, we need to invest in their health for the long term. So that the children who are getting an education are being um, invested in to not get Alzheimer's disease when they're 70. That's a life course approach to prevention. But also, um, at every, we know a lot now. We don't know everything we need to know, but we know a lot about the points, the critical points of vulnerability at every age and stage where prevention matters to create health for the future. Um, but we need, this is not a choose one age and only invest in that agenda. It's an ongoing one with a very high return on investment, very high return on investment. Trust for America's Health said uh, two years ago that there is a 4x return on investment for prevention. And if prevention from at a population level creates about 60 to 70 percent of health, which it does, then we should be investing for that high return on investment. But at the same time, we need to invest in healthcare systems that actually know how to take care of people with chronic problems um, in a way that optimizes outcome at lower costs. And I have to say to Corey that the Hartford Foundation has been a world leader in in with a vision to create those and fund them, and I had the deep honor when I led geriatrics at Johns Hopkins to partner with you in doing that. And there are models that would be useful all over the world in terms of best practices in geriatrics. Whether it's geriatrics, whether it's public health, um, investing in creating health and well-being into the oldest ages turns out to be good for all ages. Um, so here's another exa example. A number of you brought up livable cities, age-friendly cities. There's no question um, that investing in cities that would be good to grow old in would be, turn out to be the same cities that are good for everybody at every age. And if we learn to design <laughs> cities of the future for both old and young, we do even better. And those in the middle would, would benefit hugely. Um, we need to, so here's one other need, though, a very basic need, which is that human beings of every single age, and particularly older people, need to stay engaged. They need to stay engaged. Um, I, there was a spate of time in the late 80s when I, for whatever reason, was seeing a huge series of patients who um, were depressed. And the reason every single one of them was depressed, as it turned out, was that they had no reason to get up in the morning. And the reason they had no reason to get up in the morning was that we have not const yet constructed a society that lets people of a, a lifetime of experience contribute that in the world around them. A lifetime of experience at a point in their lives when leaving a legacy and making a difference is sometimes the most important thing you can do. Uh, we have not yet constructed that stage of our, of our society where people can give back in a way that matters hugely. Um, and if we talk about opportunities, then this is the place to go because it also matches needs. So uh, I, I want to end with kind of three framings. One is that in order for us to make progress, I think, not only do we have to accept that old people are us, <laughs> or our grandchildren are the old people we're building for, but we need to actually um, get 
not only get old, but get the opportunities of, of an aging society. And because if we can construct them, then we can, we can psychologically address the needs more readily at a policy level, and we can financially balance them, the opportunities and needs out. So our current policy metric is the, a major one, is the old age dependency ratio, an anachronistic metric which says that um, it compares the number of old people, by definition dependent, to the number of old people in the working age population. Um, by that metric, we can't afford many things. But that metric is an anachronism. Um, as it represents the true current and potential benefit to costs of creating an aging society that brings out the benefits and keeps people healthy so the costs are down. Um, so what could a, a, a 21st century policy metric be that would serve us? Well, I think it would be a benefit-cost ratio that actually would take into account the social capital of an aging society. So older people are the only increasing natural resource in the entire world. <laughs> the only one. Um, they bring, uh, whether it's in the workforce or in the family or in volunteer situations or community engagement situations, they bring an altruism and a generative desire to leave the world better for their grandkids that you can't beat and that gets people up in the morning and it keeps them there and it produces results if you create the social institutions that enable that. Um, so I'll tell you two stories. One is I, I've had the pleasure for um, 25 years of working on um, a no longer small project which is called Experience Corps. So I had the, uh, many years ago, I designed Experience Corps with Mark Friedman to try and see if we could have a model one model, of harnessing the social capital of an aging population in a way that made profound differences on our collective future. Um, the model I chose was to create a senior volunteer program that was of high intensity that put a critical mass of older adults in public elementary schools in the U.S. to transform the academic success of the kids. Not as teachers, but to bring to flood the schools with the social, the human capital that's missing. And it turns out it works, but it's also designed to be a public health program. So if you have a reason to get up in the morning, if you have things to do that you know are making a difference, if you have a new social network of friends and colleagues to be a problem solver with and to take care of each other afterwards um, when you need backup, if you have to walk to school and get up and down from those ridiculously low chairs every day um, and climb the stairs, it turns out you get more exercise than we look for in exercise trials for older people. And if you actually design this to exercise your brain in ways that cognitive neuropsychologists know matters, it turns out from our studies that you improve your mental function and potentially protect against things like the development of cognitive decline. We could do this in many ways. Experience course now in 23 US cities, it's in a number of countries. It's not the only program we need. It was the first model to try and provide a model. But it says that we, that we can create win-wins across generations in every dimension. We don't have to invest just one age group at a time. And in fact, the outcomes for all of us would be better <coughs> if we get creative about investing in ways that um, are, uh, are two-firs and three-firs and win-wins in multiple directions. Now, um, there's an organization um, in, hold on, I just want to read you something, um, in Uganda called the Uganda Rural Development and Training Program, which is in rural Kibali district. And they have developed a bottom-up approach to integrated rural development over the past 25 years. 
And their programs are designed, as Kofi Annan said in 1998, to fix the, fix the glaring mismatch of a mass of educated young people who cannot find jobs in the cities and who are unwilling to go back to the rural areas from which they came. And this is focused on building community development and capacity. They've done many things. They have a girls' school. They have a vocational skills institute. They have the African Rural University for Women with a three-year bachelor's, bachelor's degree in integrated rural development leadership. But what they, in addition, what they have done is they've created a youth leadership program as part of a vocational training program funded by the government in which older adults, as well as middle-aged adults, are the vocational trainers for these young people to bring the cutting edge schools and the lifelong experience together so that they can stay in the rural districts and build success um, in, in new approaches, um, whether it's from very practical skills in making prod products like charcoal refrigerators and fixing cars, to being able to write a business plan and make um, and manage a business so they can be job creators to improved approaches to agriculture. Older adults in that program are important creators of the future for these young people, just as Experience Corps is seeking to do in different ways. So part, if we talk about economic development, I would argue that older adults as the only increasing natural resource which has unique sets of skills and attributes, unique, um, could be the key to what many countries are struggling with, which is a youth bulge of young people who aren't getting educated for jobs um, and aren't getting employed. And there could be a gazillion ways, a gazillion ways, to train and deploy older people to provide the glide path for young people into a future of success. And it turns out that actually the alternative is what I hear a number of university presidents around the world saying, which is we are wasting our demographic dividend. We are wasting it because the power of this youth bulge, if it were succeeding economically, if these young people were getting jobs, would be in fueling the future of our country. So. Um, the timing is acute and, in a lot of ways, perhaps an emergency for many countries to ensure the success of the youth bulge while simultaneously preparing for when those young people are old in a mere 40 years. Um, so a couple principles I'll end with as I think about it. One, the age of either <laughs> or is over. <laughs> We have to seek co-benefits and tri-benefits and multi-benefits uh, that both bring people together, but also invest in one group to support the success of the next, that design cities for old people so they'll be good for everybody, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the WHO has said that we need to seek co-benefits in preventing non-communicable diseases of designing interventions at a population level that prevent those diseases and those same interventions could prevent a lot of the environmental harm that we are experiencing in climate change. I would add a tri-benefit of designing everything to make sure that it's good for the old and good for the young because everybody will be better off. The other principle is that timing matters and there is not much time. The third principle is that there are, I think, stages of when of, of developing a successful aging society. If I look at the US, what got put in place in 1932 before the aging of the population in terms of social security, the most popular program in this country could not be implemented now, I would bet. It could not be implemented now. The timing of having implemented it before the population age was an unintentional stroke of genius, which could be learned from. Um, but there are probably next stages after you put in place this, the social protection um, and the value as assertions, the human rights guarantees, um, because there are realignments of 
of all the things that we have been investing in. Uh, prevention, a life course approach to prevention, moving acute care, medical care to co coordinated continuum of care, and hopefully now adding geriatric knowledge. And then envisioning like uh, the CEO of a startup, the new roles, the new institutions that could harness the social capital of our only increasing natural resource on behalf of our collective future. Should older adults be leading the worldwide campaign against climate change. That is probably the one group that could get behind it without ideology, because it's about their grandkids. So this is an amazing moment of a combination of a need, a acute need for right timing, the opportunity for bringing knowledge to realignment, and the bold vision of a startup, all in one place place, um, or all on one set of issues, um, in, in the face of needing to evolve a social compact across generations and within societies about who we want to become. Thank you. Mm -hmm.